Hello again, and welcome to another one of our recorded lectures. This time we're going to be looking at the sectional conflict. And the sectional conflict is sort of the general term for the period in the sort of first half of the 1800s where you have growing tensions between different parts of the country over a number of different issues. Um, certainly the most significant of those issues was, of course, slavery, but um, it actually involved a number of different questions regarding territorial expansion, regarding infrastructure, regarding the government policies as far as tariffs or cultural differences or all kinds of different things. Um, we're going to look primarily at westward expansion because that's really the main thing that is causing a lot of the um, disagreement and growing um, sort of antagonism and especially that ends up filtering into north versus south. But again, it's a much more complicated thing if we had more time and, um, you know, this was a different course besides the kind of freshman survey, we would get into that in more detail. So when we talked last, we were looking at expansion itself, right? The process by which the country is growing um, in the first 50 years of the 19th century and how it's adding new territory and that kind of thing. Um, and we touched occasionally, I hinted a little bit at some of the dangers and challenges that that process is going to present. Um, and this is where we're really going to develop those issues in more detail because this is in many ways the thing that leads to the Civil War. Because as we'll see when we get to that particular topic, the war isn't actually about the North wanting to get rid of slavery and the South wanting to keep it. It's much more complicated and much more nuanced um, than just that kind of simple black and white you know, representation. So we'll get into this. It's going to be broken down into, um, I don't know, three, maybe four different sections. This is a longer kind of topic. Um, and so make sure that you're staying with not only these recordings, but also the full PowerPoints that are included on Blackboard for you. Um, I will mention that I have um, a cat down here in the basement with me. And if my basement is anything like yours, um, or if yours is anything like mine, it's filled with all kinds of stuff for cats to wander around and uh, make noise in. So I apologize if he interrupts and tries to offer corrections or um, asks for attention. Um, I'll have to deal with that when it happens. So without further stalling for time, here we go. So... The central kind of consideration for a lot of people regarding the expansion of the country is how does that impact the balance of power in Congress between free and slave states? So as we talked about in the last section, we looked at a lot of the process by which the country is adding new land, whether it's through outright purchases like the Louisiana Purchase, whether it's through negotiation like the Oregon Territory, um, whether it's warfare like the Mexican Cession, lots of different things going on. And so part of the concern is how is that actually going to um, result in the addition of either slave or free states? And neither side wants to allow the other to get a significant advantage in Congress. And so the big concern is if you had one side or the other, the free side or the slave side, gaining more and more and more power in Congress and more and more states, the danger is that that particular side could either abolish or guarantee slavery with a constitutional amendment. And neither side is willing to risk the possibility of the other side getting to that point. So yes, there's issues of representation in Congress or the Electoral College, but at the base of all of that is that concern that 
eventually the possibility will be there that one side will be able to dominate to the point that they can get a constitutional amendment which will um, sort of establish that particular side as the permanent side, right? Either guaranteeing slavery or permanently abolishing slavery. And so the problem really becomes, what do you do when each new state is going to be carved out of that territory that the country is adding? Again, <clears throat> like I said, there are other sectional issues at work, um, whether it's issues with government involvement in internal improvements, whether it's issues with foreign trade, whether it's issues of culture, but we're not going to touch on a lot of those just because of the nature of our class and, and the limitations that we're working with. So the first time that this really becomes a significant kind of an issue is with what's known as the Missouri Compromise. So the United States adds the Louisiana Territory in 1803-1804. And it takes about 15 years before the first state is ready to be carved out of that territory to be added to the United States. And that state is going to be Missouri. So in 1819, residents of Missouri start to go through the process of applying for statehood. And we haven't had a new state since um, 1959, right? So we've got a long time since people have actually experienced the process of adding a state. But it is a process, right? It takes stages that have to go through Congress and with the territory itself, et cetera, et cetera. So Missouri as a territory allowed slavery. But when it's trying to be admitted as a state, Northern congressmen in particular are starting to push back against the idea of that state allowing slavery um, because there is a, a very equal balance of 11 free states and 11 slave states in Congress at that time. And so obviously having 12 to 11 isn't going to be a huge shift in power, but any shift can be seen as potentially leading towards that slippery slope where, well, if we let this one in, then the next one's going to be, and so on and so on, and pretty soon you're going to have that, um, that overall sort of tilt in one direction or another. So Missouri is applying for statehood. It had slavery as the territory, so naturally it's going to apply to try to have slavery in the state. Um, when it becomes a state after that admissions process. Fortunately or unfortunately, there is this kind of convenient timing whereby Maine applies for statehood very shortly after Missouri applies for statehood. And you literally cannot get further north than Maine in the 48 states. It is the furthest north state that there is, other than Alaska, but that's the one that's going to come in 1959. Um, one of the ones in 1959. And so the sort of obvious solution here is, well, we'll just let Missouri come in as a slave state, we'll bring Maine in as a free state, and once again, instead of being 11 to 11 or 12 to 11, lickety split will just be 12 to 12. And so problem solved, right? Well, no, not really. Because all of that territory of the Louisiana Purchase is still up for grabs. Missouri is the first state to be coming into the Union from that space, but it's certainly not going to be the last. And so the question is, should we just tackle this every single time a new state wants to come in from the Louisiana Territory? If so, there's no guarantee that there's going to be an equal opposite state, right? So whatever state is coming in from Louisiana, it might be a free state, it might be a slave state. <clears throat> With the case of Missouri, there happened to be Maine who could balance that out. But 
there's no guarantee that there will always be an opposite number that will be ready to enter the union. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so what happens then is one of the congressmen involved in this conversation introduces what's called the Thomas Amendment. And the Thomas Amendment is a little tough to kind of um, describe, but essentially it says we will draw a line across the Louisiana Territory that runs from the boundary, the southern boundary of Missouri. And we're going to... Hey, William, stop it. Sorry. Hey. We're going to ban slavery from existing in any state that comes out of the Louisiana Territory from north of that line, with the obvious exception of Missouri. So here's a map to kind of put it in a little bit better perspective. So the green states in 1820 are states where slavery is permitted. The red states are states where slavery is not permitted. The kind of darker brownish color, the dirt brown color, um, is unorganized territory, right? This means that it's territory that belongs to the United States that is technically under the control of the federal government, but has not become a state yet. So Missouri, you can see they're perched kind of right smack in the middle of the map. Below it, what they call Arkansas territory on the map, is territory that according to the Missouri Compromise is allowed to have slavery. The territory in brown that's called unorganized territory above that red line is territory from the Louisiana Purchase that cannot have slavery. Well, anybody looking at that map is going to realize that there's a much, much greater opportunity for free states to come out of the Louisiana Territory, right, all of that brown space, much greater opportunity for that to produce multiple free states compared to the number of states that can come out of the Arkansas Territory. And so this means that you have... In theory, the solution for, well, this is going to settle the question of what states and what territories will be free and what will be slave. The problem here, though, is the country doesn't stop with the Louisiana Territory, right? In 1836, you have the beginning of that whole question about what to do with Texas. In the 1840s, then, you have the question of what to do with the Oregon country up in the top left. In 1848, 49, 50, you start to have the question of what to do with all of the new land that the U.S. gets from Mexico at the end of the Mexican-American War. And so in 1820, people think, wow, it's great, we've got the Missouri Compromise, we've settled that question once and for all, and so everything's going to be fine. But that's not the case, because they can't see the future. Nobody can see the future. And so they don't know that the country is going to keep adding bigger and bigger and bigger chunks of territory that will keep bringing this question of what do we do about slavery back into the mix. One of the other attempts to deal with this whole situation, and it's one that we talked about um, very briefly when we mentioned the Mexican-American War, was an effort right before the war begins where President Polk says, you know what, Rather than going to war to get this territory, maybe I can just buy it from Mexico. Maybe I can just buy some territory, settle this whole situation, um, and that will be that. And so he asks Congress for money. And the House of Representatives is the part of Congress that actually deals with money, right? Both houses have to vote, et cetera, et cetera, but the House of Representatives is the part of Congress that actually, um, you know, controls the purse strings. 
So Polk goes to Congress and he says, I want this money to try to buy territory from Mexico. And there's this really little known, otherwise historically pretty unimportant guy named David Wilmot. He's a Democrat from Pennsylvania, and he is personally an anti-slavery representative. He's not outspoken, he's not an abolitionist, he's just anti-slavery. <clears throat> and Wilmot adds this little, what they call a rider, to the funding bill that the House of Representatives is looking at. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this rider is known as the Wilmot Proviso. And the Wilmot Proviso basically kills this funding bill dead on arrival. But essentially, it would have said any money going to pay for this sort of process, the land that that buys has to be slave free. In other words, Wilmot says, if you want this money, that's fine, but keep in mind that if we give you this money legally, this, this rider, this provision, will require that any land that that money buys will be slave free. It gets through the House of Representatives, but it fails in the Senate. Why? Well, the House of Representatives, because it's, it's appointed by population, means that the northern states have more representatives. They have enough to push this through the House, but the Senate equal representation, you have equal numbers of states, slave and free, and so there's enough of a um, either pro-slavery or anti-slavery anti side in the Senate that they can kill this bill. And in this process, Southern lawmakers start to introduce one of the really, really common legal arguments regarding slavery. And this is going to be something that will come back a number of times in the next several sections um, of this particular topic. And that is the argument that slaves are property. Enslaved people, according to Southern law, and in many cases, according to federal law, enslaved people are not people in, in the sense of being free individuals who can determine their own futures. They exist as property, much in the same way that a person can own a horse. It's disgusting to say, it's disgusting to think about, um, it can be shocking to realize that that is the way that people perceived this at the time, um, but that's the reality. And so the Southern argument, and some Northerners are arguing this as well, is slavery, because slaves are property and not people, Slavery is constitutionally protected because the Constitution guarantees people, citizens, the right to own property and that the government can't interfere with that. It's obviously much more complicated than that, but that's the broad strokes. And so Southern lawmakers at this point and other times are saying, you can't do this because preventing or restricting our ability to own or move property from one place to another in the United States is unconstitutional. That's going to be a really, really essential question and, and argument that will pop up over and over again over the next several recordings and throughout the full PowerPoints that 
you know, I want you to look at online as well. And it's ultimately going to return as a significant part of a massively important um, Supreme Court decision in 1857, which we'll touch on and that you're also going to be learning about from your podcasts and YouTube videos. So that's the sort of breaking point for the first section here um, of our sectional conflict material. We're going to pick this up again um, with sort of what's going on as the Mexican session starts to be added, what happens with California, what kinds of solutions are offered for how to deal with this issue of expanding slavery into these new territories. Um, but those will be coming in future recordings, and so make sure that you're checking those out. Make sure that you're getting in touch with me if you've got questions about any of this material. Um, I'm more than happy to, um, you know, do what I can to, to help address those, okay? So I hope everybody's having a great day, and be safe, be well, and I will see you soon.